and printing for mitral valve repair. Thank you, Eric. Uh, so It's a pleasure to be here to talk to you about some innovative work we're doing at the Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi about 3D imaging and printing for mitral valve disease. So just quickly, I'm going to talk about the mitral valve disease epidemiology, uh, the prosthetic valve e evolution, and modalities that are used for 3D imaging, the 3D imaging printing process, and printing mitral valves. So mortality from mitral, uh, from valvular disease is, is increasing predominantly for aortic valvular disease in the U.S., whereas uh, mitral valve disease is relatively stable and rheumatic heart disease is decreasing. Uh, this is very similar in Europe as well, and that's due to the uh, pro, uh, use of antibiotics for streptococcal infections to, for, uh, for rheumatic uh, disease. Um, the... Uh, Worldwide, uh, the mortality uh, related to rheumatic heart disease is significant, and it is, per and it, there is a quarter of a million deaths annually from uh, mitral rheumatic heart disease uh, worldwide. Um, so this is a significant uh, disease, and it has uh, potential. Uh, newer techniques have greater potential in, in non-Western areas. The uh, if I give you an example of the evolution of mechanical heart valves, uh, there's been a significant change in mechanical heart valve design from when it started with a, a ball valve design to, a, to a, a flat disc, to a tilting disc, and then to a bi-leaflet, and, and, and there's even now a tri-leaflet mechanical heart valve. This evolution really is uh, done from the progression and improvement, the iterative improvement of the heart valve. Similarly, we're undergoing an evolutionary process with percutaneous valves, whereas when the first uh, sort of percutaneous pulmonic valve, this, this now a melody valve that Philippe Bonhoeffer developed, and now there's the core valve and the Cribier Edwards valve. These are all iterative improvements in the valve that are designed. The difference between a mechanical valve that is surgically implanted and a percutaneous design is that you really can't size the valve physically by looking at it and putting in a valve sizer into the position of where the valve annulus. A percutaneous valve, the, the chest is closed, and there's no way to actually do it contemporaneously at the time of the surgery. So then you have to take a step backwards, and you have to think about what imaging modality can be done to, in order to prepare for the correct implantation of the size of the valve. Now, typically, we use what's available to us commonly, and that would be echocardiography, TEE or TTE, to assess the valve, uh, fluoroscopy and angiography, depending upon at the time of assessment. The limitations of the echocardiography are is that it's difficult to get an accurate three-dimensional or, or planar image of the valve. Um, it's, it's basically a, uh, you do a sweep through and you can get measurements, but the, the valve is, is a, com the mitral valve is a complex three-dimensional saddle-shaped annulus, which is not accurately represented in a single two-dimensional or planar image. Um, so the other options for evaluating the mitral valve include cardiac MR, and uh, this is a powerful technique to really image the and stratify the patient for uh, planning purposes and, and to look at the degree of, say, ischemic mitral valve, ischemic disease that is affecting the mitral valve prosthesis, uh, papillary muscles, and the function of the valve leaflets, the opening, the closing of leaflets, and the, and the regurgitation and stenosis. CT, however, has really been the mainstay of focus for looking at percutaneous transaortic valve implantation because of its ability to take a snapshot of volumetric data, that's a, a cube of data, and then you can slice that information and create arbitrary planes and take the time to do the measurements um, in order to plan for the percutaneous aortic valve. 
basically the, as you know, is the aortic valve annulus is oval shaped and measuring that accurately is important to correctly size the valve. So taking that what we already know in existence and using that to apply that to mitral valve uh, implantation is important. Um, you know, the work done to look at the degree of calcifications and extent of the calcifications is important as the valvular disease progresses. It gets calcified uh, due to the irritation and, um, and healing processes. Uh, you can also take and measure, do CR measurements for accurate planning purposes for your fluoroscopy and so that you can create the, don't waste time in the procedural to do the, to plan the C-arms. And I just wanted to give you a presentation of a, of a patient that we did recently, 68-year-old female with severe aortic and mitral valve disease. She had already had a tower in place uh, in the aortic position, and she, and she agreed because she had persistent worsening mitral valvular disease and congestive heart failure to have a valve and valve taver, as well as a transapical, uh, transcatheter mitral valve position. So the, the three-dimensional volumetric imaging helps uh, get an idea of the, where the relationship of the, the mitral valve calcifications are and the, and to the existing percutaneous valve. I think this volumetric data is important to dis determine the extent of the disease in concert, in association with all of the other modalities that are used, the, the echo and the, and the angiography, to get a full picture of what's going on. So we took that volumetric data and just put it into standardized planes, three-chamber, two-chamber, and short axis. The short axis, the two-chamber plane is to get to an idea of where that valve is going to sit. You can actually measure out the valve, the dimensions of the valve and placement into the annulus, sort of a one-third, two-third positioning, and get an idea of wh how much of the left ventricular outflow tract is going to be uh, narrowed or from the placement of the valve before it's even put in place. This is important because there's an extension of that proximal portion of the valve stent into the LV lumen, and there's certainly, you can create a stenosis from that uh, if, it's, if, it's our, if it's too narrow. The estimated area that which, uh, per other reports, has been safe is about 250 millimeters squared for this LV area as you move down into this two-chamber view get an idea of how much residual neo LV area will be left and then uh, so that you can anticipate on what to do. This particular patient had a, uh, a septal ablation in order to create some more room uh, after, after the uh, mitral valve was placed and, and that reduced the LV outflow tract gradient significantly. But this information, this data that can, is in, in this volumetric data can be printed using the technology that is available, and I just want to review quickly the, the, the stages of process in order to get from the CT imaging to a, a 3D image, and it's important that uh, for 3D imaging, because we're not always visual or auditory, and we actually need to actually touch some of these things, it's a lot easier sometimes to see and, and touch uh, a 3D printout and understand the 3D structures rather than looking at it on a screen, on some radiologist screen, and, and then piloting through the, the large amount of data. So the first step is to take that DICOM image file, which is the, which is the and then convert it to a stereolithographic model. And then that is, then uh, the file is converted and adjusted. Uh, it's smoothed out, so there's a little bit of loss of fine detail, and then it's printed out using a variety of different techniques, including stereolithography, which is what we consider the standard 3D printing, which is layer by layer, uh, laser sintering, which is uh, using a laser that, that uh, will heat up a powder, and then that creates the, uh, the material, and uh, a polyjet technology, which is uh, a softer plastic material, uh, some binder jetting and, and fused deposition. If you take that 3D information, you have to segment out the, the actual valve, mater valve itself, the valve annulus, the, the leaflets, and the subvalvular apparatus, and then print it out. This is an, I'm going to give you two examples of what we've done for printing out. One is a laser sintering. It is a hard material. Um, it, is, um, it prints for thin, uh, delicate, delicate detail. And just here's a, a, a patient with mitral valve prolapse. 
and you can see the, the prolapsed leaflet. Uh, what would be good for this is it's, it's got a, a firm structure. It's, it's expensive, but it would be good for prototyping new valves, uh, whereas you could print the new valve out, which is firm and rigid, and you could place it into uh, another model, which is softer and more representative of the mitral valve annulus. Here's another example of a 3D printed uh, structure, which this is a soft polyjet uh, material. You could take the, a stent uh, and place it into this, and the material expands a little bit, and it can be color coordinated so you can understand the different structures. Um, the technology is still in, in evolution, and the ideal properties of the plastic material and, the, and the, the structure is not yet completely fully developed, but I think that the, these combining the techniques of the new valves with the 3D printed will assist in a variety of different things for the future, including patient-specific anatomic planning, uh, patient uh, and education, and show the patient, I'm gonna do this procedure on you, and this is how it's gonna, ha what's gonna go, and this is how it's gonna happen. That's very powerful. Uh, resident and fellow simulations for training purposes. It's often better to do it in a, in a model or a, a simulation before doing it in an actual patient if it's the very first time for them. Marketing purposes, you can take this 3D model and show others uh, what, you, you know, what you plan to do or what you have done. Uh, research and, and, and uh, product design, uh, I think that the rigid materials will be better for uh, planning. You, get, you have a new valve design and you want to place it into something so that you Use, a, uh, um, use that rigid material to create annual plastic uh, rings, and then product, uh, valve design validation. You know, you, you've got the valve, the stented valve, and you need to place it into something that is, that is anatomically correct and soft like tissue, and so placing that valve into there. Uh, and so, in summary, the, I went over the epidemia of mitral valve disease, the importance of it in the, in, 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 other than the U.S. and the and the Europe, the evolution of valve design as it's continually evolving and changing. That we need to adapt new imaging modalities to uh, and techniques to uh, look at the images, look at the patient, uh, planning for per percutaneous uh, valve implantation, and printing of the mitral valve. And uh, and again, I think that the future of it is is is, is really up to you and how you use uh, these new technologies. So, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. We'll take some questions at the end. Uh, I'd ask the speakers we need to see.